So tonight we have got my uh, brother, my actual brother. I often uh, introduce people as like my brother from another mother. This is my brother from my actual mother. And uh, he's talking about his business, All Things Butter, or he's talking about how he's got to a place um, of launching a new brand in a big grown up category and having some traction. And the fascinating part of his story, I've not actually heard it, by the way, as I make this video, I've heard he's given me the, the highlights. But the fascinating bits of his story for me are, as he's gone through his career doing seemingly random stuff, it's actually gone on to serve him very well. And at the time, he didn't realize how well it was gonna serve him. And I think that's a really lovely takeaway when you're thinking about your own career. And actually, some of the stuff that, that didn't work for Toby became critical in what's gone on to work for him. So that's kind of one big takeaway. Another big takeaway is he now sells butter for a living. If you ask 21 year old Toby, if you told him actually he was gonna be a butter churner for a living, he'd have, he'd have told you to get lost. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing in itself. Like most of us were not um, born knowing we were gonna be a doctor. You know, that's the kind of dream, knowing you've got this, knowing the vocation from birth. Some people have got it, most of us don't. And I think if you're presented with your vocation, your true calling, age 21, sometimes it would sound bizarre. And you need the kind of bumpy, squiggly experiences on the way to kind of find it and realize that that's for you. And that's what Toby's gonna to talk about. So, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my brother from my actual mother, uh, Toby Hopkins. Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, it's so lovely to be in Manchester. I've lived here for so long and uh, haven't been up actually far too, well, haven't been up anywhere near as much as I'd like to. I live in London now with a, with a three-year-old, another baby on the way, and um, uh, in Teddington, which is very different from Manchester, which, yeah, so it's lovely to be here, so thanks so much for having me. As Max said, uh, I am Toby. I'm the youngest uh, Hopkinson boy. I've got both my brothers here. For some reason, Ollie's wearing his backpack. It's like he wants to leave. It's like, it's, it's like is this, uh, this going to be straight out the door? Let's see. Yeah, ready to go. Um, and as Max said, I'm, I'm the co-founder of a, of a dairy business called All Things Butter. Quite a lot of you may not know what this is. Uh, it's a bit rogue. Let's be honest, uh, new dairy businesses, there hasn't been many of them over the last 30 or so years. But we launched about four or five months ago. Uh, we've got some pretty amazing listings so far and some big ones uh, coming up. And we're really trying to change the, ways peop uh, the way people's relationship is with butter. So it, 20 or so years ago, it was very much um, a staple within people's diet to be cooking with it and, and taste absolutely amazing. And then margarine alternatives came along and kind of blasted butter being a dreadful, uh, a dreadful product for you. But I think that it's really taken a turn in particular over the last year or so um, with like the likes of Dr. Tim Perspector from Zoe talking about natural foods. And for us, we felt there was a real opportunity within the space to come up with a brand that has a bit of innovation in product. So we have quite a unique way we make our butter to make it extra creamy. And we also have flavors, uh, which is something that no one has really done on a mass scale. And on top of that, we've, we've got a very modern approach to the way that our branding is. So if you guys all go to the, the butter aisle, it's pretty much looked the same for the last 20 or 30 years. And so we've really tried to do something that stands out for the crowd and have a bit of fun, like you can see the cow's little bum there. But if you see the packaging and there's, there's loads of salted butter over there that I just got delivered, uh, annoyingly, we've sold out flavors. So you can have as many as you like, but we've really tried to stand out from the, from the crowd, from the shelf. Can but, people take those home? Yeah, yeah, take them home, yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, please take them home. And if you want to buy any more, please go onto the website or something. Um, not that I'm not allowed to sell anything, but I'm meant to be selling at the end as well, but let's see how we go. Um, but I don't actually want to talk to you too much about butter, and you can ask me as many questions afterwards uh, if you'd like to know. But more the fact that when Max kind of suggested a title from the talk, Squiggly Marketing Career, it really resonated with me. And then I actually realized today that he named it after my career, not that it wasn't a series. <laughs> I thought this was like this new series called Squiggly Martin Careers. He was like, yeah, named it after. It's like, a book, but, but, that, but you're right. No, okay. This is the only one. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is the only one. Well, it really resonated with me. <laughs> uh, because my career is genuinely a squiggly line. And, and kind of in the middle now, we've got 
we've got a bit of butter in there. And it's, there, there has been a constant. I've worked in predominantly marketing for my entire career, but pretty much most categories you can think of, from washing machines, razors, um, plants. Uh, I've also worked agency side and client side. And so if I think back now, and I have actually been doing a lot of this over the last six months or so into, into like the last kind of 12, 13 years of my career, I realized that actually I was pretty, I was pretty lost like five, six years ago, and predominantly when I dropped out of university, we'll talk a little bit more uh, afterwards, but I was very lost in that I, I didn't really know which direction it was going to go. I, I, kinda, I knew that I really liked marketing, but I, I hadn't really sat on something which I was like, oh, God, I'm, I I'm really feel passionate about what I'm doing. And when I was younger, like as Max said, my dad was an entrepreneur, and he was very, very, um, he was incredibly passionate about what, 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 he, what he wanted to do. And I actually found, weirdly, a bit of inspiration from a Lighthouse family concert, which, yeah, I know, it sounds a bit strange. And, uh, and it really showed my age, actually. Today, I was with one of the team from All Things But who's about 21 or 22, and she asked if the Lighthouse family was a TV show. <laughs> it's like, uh, so, uh, and, and the reason why I got this inspiration was I was 10 years old, and I went to the MEN Arena, and I watched this concert, and I was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever been to. The lights, the, the, the atmosphere, the show. And from that day, I was convinced I was going to be an event manager. And uh, I knew nothing about events management, apart from the fact that I wanted to put on massive concerts. And so, very quickly, over this, sorry, not very quickly, over between 10 and 18, I didn't really have any inspiration to do anything else, apart from be this events manager. I'd somehow kept on to it that I really wanted to, to put on these concerts. And so at 18 years old, I, I enrolled into Manchester Metropolitan University to do events management without reading the syllabus. Just, I was convinced, this is my calling. I've been thinking about it since I was 10. After about six weeks and I saw the syllabus, that most of it was around technical aspect of putting on events, whether it's talking to council, health and safety, I realized this was definitely not the course for me. <laughs> However, in that period, I did have my Lighthouse family moment. It may not have been the bright lights of the MEN Arena. It was a dingy nightclub in Fallowfield. And I became a nightclub promoter. And that really was a time for me where I got that kick that I, that I wanted to do from, the, from, from, from first seeing that concert and really saw people enjoying themselves. And I didn't actually used to talk about this at all. It was called Fresh Fridays. If anyone's about my age and in Manchester, you may, have, may or may not have gone. Uh, hopefully it has been. Um, but it was, it was actually pretty successful. And if I break down the simplicity of a weekly student night, it's actually not so different to what I do right now. You've obviously got to create a brand. You've got to get people through the door, like acquiring customers. And then you've got to give them an experience that makes them want to come back next week. The business doesn't at a weekly student night, and I've seen many of them before, they fail if you don't obviously bring in repeat customers because, like anything, if you don't bring in repeat customers, you're, you're not going to do particularly well. I also learned a lot from that uh, when I think back of, of being creative with budget. We, we were students at the end of the day. Like, we didn't have any marketing budgets. We, we didn't kind of speak to the CEO and say, give us some money. We were just, we were just kind of trying to do it on a shoestring, and it, and it allowed us to be incredibly creative with, with, with the resource that we had and made us think outside the box, which, to be honest, like, if I think back to, to, the, to the times that I was in the likes of, like, Queen of Hearts in Fallowfield, just sat down with my friends, just thinking, what stupid, crazy things can we do? And a, a couple of the examples were, like, we got our cars and we converted them in two days, head to toe, every body part, in flyers. So we literally had these giant flyers drying around. And then we thought, well, we want to park them in high footfall areas. So we parked them outside Sainsbury's in Fellowfield. We blasted out 90s hip hop. We had some friends who were dancers who were like break dancing outside. <laughs> and then we were giving out flyers. And the only cost was just our time and like sticking the flyers on the car. And that really is like a kind of small experiential marketing uh, kind of stunt that we did. But there was no. There was no mind set to think, oh, let's do some experiential marketing. It was like, let's do something which is going like, to generate buzz. Let's have some fun. Like, How do we get people talking? In the, in the end of the day, it's an incredibly saturated market. 
uh, student nights, as I'm sure if any of you have been to university, they're flying here, they're doing this, they're doing that. They're really trying to like, get as many people in there as possible. And then we had another fortunate thing within the team that we had is that one of my kind of co-founders of Fresh Fridays, he was, um, he, his brother was a football player for uh, Man City. And so, and this you definitely wouldn't get away with it uh, today. There's definitely, they're too conscious of, of, of image, but we actually just sent into the city training ground a shitload of uh, Fresh Fridays merchandise. And so we would just kind of like occasionally throw out on Facebook Mario Balotelli wearing a Fresh Fridays t-shirt <laughs> or Joe Hart or Sean Wright Phillips. And again, like there was no thought process of let's put together an influencer marketing strategy. It was just like, well, what resources do we have? Who do we know? How can we really try and get the brand out there with as minimal budget as possible? Um, and it was, particularly now when I think back on it, it was, it was a, like it, it had such an influence on what I was doing, and, and and also the, the confidence that as a younger person that I had then of where I say in the middle of my career where I certainly didn't have the confidence then just to go on, just to go and do it and just go and go out there and really try and grasp something which uh, which for me like. The, the end goal was that I wanted to kind of try and extend my university career as long as possible despite not being there. But still I had that goal in mind of being like, right, how can I do that? And then it really, it really focused me to, 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 to create something which was relatively successful considering. However, there was a sustainability element to it of can I be a student nightclub promoter for the rest of my life? <laughs> which after, I did it for two years, which was a pretty good stint to be honest. Uh, but the late nights, the, the drinking, the, the just general partying all the time was just not sustainable. And for me, is, in particular now, I know myself significantly better. Structure is like very, very important to me, having a, stru having a structured life. So I sat down with my old man, and, uh, and we were kind of evaluating what should I do. I knew I had to take a pay cut, um, because these events did pretty well. Uh, but I knew that social media and social media hadn't quite kicked off in like the advertising space uh, as much as say it is now or has been the last 10 years. And so I actually settled on, uh, well say settled, I actually interviewed for a business selling washing machines and tumble dryers and, and fridge freezers, which is slightly different to grotty nightclubs in, uh, in Fallowfield. However, and it wasn't actually called AO back then, it was called Appliance Online, which Kate will know because Kate used to be my manager. Um, it was, uh, yeah, called Appliance Online. And they actually, despite being one of the incredibly boring category, they were a blueprint for Facebook marketing back in 2012. They were one of the first big brands to invest very heavily into, uh, into Facebook marketing. I think at one time, we were like top five spender in the UK or something along those lines. Like, it was an insane amount what we were doing. And... The reason for it, I mean, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we did uh, secondary, but the reason why we did it is that as a business, we saw, we didn't do any other above the line marketing at this point, but we saw like an almost exact correlation between our organic search impressions on Google and how much money we were spending on Facebook. And we weren't seeing in particular, the platform was pretty crap back then. We were like using the old school power editor uh, and it was really, really bad. And we couldn't see like a huge amount of ROI coming through the actual platform itself, but we could attribute pretty much any of the incre incrementality that was coming from an organic search impressions when we were upping the spend, we'd literally see an exact correlation. And so we got free reign pretty much from the, from the, senior, the senior team uh, AO to go, I think we've got something a bit special here. You guys go ahead with it. And the team at the time was an um, Israeli guy called Yossi and Kate who sat uh, at the front. And if you say go ahead with it, in particular with Yossi, we did some really, really weird stuff, <laughs> like, to be honest. And, it was, and, and, and to be honest, it kind of worked because we were selling washing machines and fridge freezers and vacuums. And <clears throat> if you guys think, any of you who are digital marketers, it's, it's really difficult to get people intrigued with what you do. And so with us, we were doing, in 2012, we were doing like live streams with like me, Kate, and Yossi, <laughs> just like to 1,000 people, like giving away vacuum cleaners and random things. But we were getting like really good traction on it. And we were also building games within the Facebook platform, getting people really to interact with it, um, which just, it just showed, and something that I've, like one of the big learnings that I took from it is that, again, kind of similar to what we were talking about with Fresh Fridays. 
is that regardless of what the category you've got, if you get given a range to go, do you know what? Let's think outside the box. I don't know that's such a cliche thing to say, think outside the box, but that is such a great example of a category that is stereotypically, if someone looked at it as a, a marketeer who wasn't thinking, right, how can we actually think differently of how this can be exciting? You could have just been stuck with just doing PPC ads and it just kind of ticking along. But it felt, and I certainly wasn't the reason for it, I was just on for the ride, but it was Kate and Yossi who really looked at this problem and were like, let's go completely wild and see actually if this would work. And it was just an amazing experience. From there, we then IPO'd, and that's when we went to AO.com. And, uh, and my role more, moved more into brand marketing. So I was looking after more above-the-line campaigns, working with media agencies for the first time, if any, anyone's in, from, from a media agency. And when I, when, when I saw the decks and the strategy that these media agencies were giving me, you'd give them like a budget, five million pounds to do, can, here's my audience, ABC One Adults, whatever the, number, whatever the, the audience is, the brief, this is who we think uh, like Karen is, this is who we think X, Y, Z is. We were trying to give these briefs, and then they came back with this 30-slide deck. And I was like, wow, that is, that's amazing. But I was also like really frustrated, because like, how did they do that? Like what is actually the mechanic underneath it? How are they building that narrative? How do they understand actually that they're reaching 76% of adults or whatever it is with a frequency of X, Y, Z? And so the time came for a bit of, a bit of time within the, within the agency world. And, and, and actually I predominantly worked, although I did kind of digital and then a bit of offline, I was predominantly working offline uh, within Mediacom and Dentsu. So I was at Dentsu in Manchester and then I was in Mediacom in London. And although I didn't do huge stints there, I think I did about a couple of years between the both of them, they were invaluable when it came to creating narrative and also looking at the strategy end to end. I, I was really fortunate to have a role that was a planner and a buyer. So rather than in quite a lot of traditional agencies, you've got a planner, then you've got a buyer, then the buyer will usually do the analysis and then the planner maybe will get the analysis back and then do a little bit of work on the uh, analysis as well. In both of the agencies I was there, we were doing uh, we, we were able to do it from end to end and really be able to understand the impact of what you were doing. And although, like, although the time was short there, I felt that one of the other great things of being in the big agencies, in particular with Medicom and Dentsu, is you had the exposure to really large clients at a very young age. And so I was kind of, what, mid-20s, and I was doing meetings with kind of CMO of Sony or uh, TUI or... I was actually at Thomas Cook at Dentsu and then Tui at Mediacom. I think that's why they, they, they wanted me. Um, but it was, it was amazing to be thrown into a deep end and be able to do presentations for really senior people. And then ask, I, I always would ask for really honest feedback about how they thought the presentation was or anything and that I'm just trying to learn to get better. And they, and they were very forthcoming every time that I would, I would ask for that. I did realize, though... Um, that working for both of those agencies is, and also working with a lot of the clients that I, was, that I was there with is that kind of these big corporations where you're a kind of a cog in this giant wheel was really not for me. I, I, I was kind of, I really wanted to understand more about how the end to end of a business worked, actually how much the work that I was doing was influencing different parts of the business. And so, although I wasn't really looking for a job, but I was kind of flirting, you know, you guys all know about that, flirting with the job market. And I saw this company that I'd never heard of and hadn't launched since the UK called Harry's, which is the razor business. And they were looking for a performance marketing manager who kind of had a bit of broad experience across offline and, and digital to come and join the team and launch the brand in the UK. I just, I did a bit of research about it. I realized that the founder was the, he was the ex-founder of Warby Parker, uh, which if you know like the New York uh, kind of startup world, that's a huge spectacles business in, in the US, which was like a unicorn. And then he moved from there into, into founding Harry's. And I really kind of bought into, I did a lot of research about it. So I really bought into the concept of it. I love the David and Goliath story around kind of Gillette being this kind of, well, P&G, who owned Gillette, being this big kind of like, um, uh, big kind of nasty business who've like monopolized the entire 
industry and basically have just driven up the price of razors for the sake of it. Like, they, their margins on razors, as you can imagine, is absolutely insane because they own the entire market. And Harry's came in and they were really well funded and I think that their concept was very strong and I thought the DTC element was in particular was very strong. But I also love the fact that they had an omni-channel side of the business but they were pushing DTC. And so I actually got a disclaimer when I was uh, interviewing there which was like, just so you know, you will be working within performance marketing but you are going to have to get your hands dirty. And for me, that was like, that really got me going. I was like, this is exactly what I want to know. I want to learn... I don't want to become an expert in operations or CX or whatever it is, but I really want to be able to understand and understand the influence of what I'm doing is to the wider business, and that I kind of had a fixation on that. And to be honest, oh, I've missed a slide. And to be honest, these are my three, chapter four, startup life. There's, I've spent a long time looking at, thinking about these titles. Uh, they're very short. <laughs> But yeah, so Harry's, and then Away, which you may not have heard of, is, is probably more American-based, but it's a luggage brand which has the batteries and the luggage. But again, was actually f founded by a former Harry's employee, raised like $100 million, and, uh, and was launching into the international market. So I went from Harry's, uh, then I went to Away, and I was looking after marketing and, and ops. But both of them had a fixation on terminology that I hadn't really heard of, like looking at unit, unit economic breakdowns, really getting into a P&L, understanding what the bottom line actually was of the work that we were doing. Um, and then th as a subscription business, fixation on lifetime value, looking at CAC to LTV ratios. These are all terminology that back then, this was kind of six years ago or so, I hadn't really heard any of this terminology before. It was very much like, here's your CPA target, hit your CPA target, and then if you can't, then kind of work out why you haven't done it. But it was very kind of rigid within that space where this kind of opened up for me a, a, a huge amount of kind of knowledge to, to, to really get a lot more underneath the data that we were doing from a, from a digital space. Away also got, had, a, had a slightly different, I learned slightly differently because it was a bit more of a premium product. So at Harry's, our hook was very much here's your trial set, then you get into a subscription, et cetera, where Away was like a $250 suitcase. So got to understand a little bit more about different marketing platforms within, uh, in a, more of a premium space. Um, but then it, like the wheels, if I'm honest, kind of fell off, like COVID happened. And as I just explained about Away, the last place you probably wanted to be in, a, uh, in COVID was working for a luggage business. And so we went from a million dollars a day revenue, within a week we went to 10K revenue, which was like an insane drop. And so I had an international office, there was about 10 of us, and there was about three or 400 people in the, U in the US office. And so they furloughed, as you can imagine, the entire international team. And so, and I was just about to have a baby, so I was like, oh, I'm really here, aren't I? So uh, why did I go to a luggage business? Should have foreseen COVID. Uh, but, I then fortunately from, uh, and, and a lot of you guys who, if you work in the D2C space, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was an area that was actually incredibly competitive and it was good for being a consultant within that, within D2C when it came to COVID times, everyone's buying online. So fortunately, I kind of did a, quite a lot of consulting work and that was really when I started working with Thomas Straker on the, on, it, was, it wasn't the butter business then, but working with him on his content so as a chef, I mean, there's, I think being in luggage or being a chef were pretty much two of the shittest careers you could have been in COVID because all the restaurants were closed and no one was flying in it and no one was allowed to leave the house. Um, and so me and Tom used to have hours and hours on the phone together and we were trying to like work out what we thought would be the best video. And, and there was no, it was more just for fun. Like there was no kind of, we're going to launch a butter business. It was like, let's see how many followers you can get after kind of a year or so of, uh, of posting videos. And so COVID, I think he went in with about three or 400 followers and we came out with 60 or 70,000. So it was like an amazing kind of push. However, for me, uh, I, and then also we were doing a few commercial partnerships. But for me, one of my clients was Trip, uh, which uh, hopefully you guys will have heard of. It's a CBD drinks business. Um, and so this was about two years ago now, uh, just from a timeline perspective. And so Trip were a client, I was doing one or two days a week, and then they decided that rather than paying a day rate, two or three days, and then I started going to three days a week, and I was like, four days a week? And they were like, absolutely fucking not. You either go on full time, or, or, or we've got to go and find someone. 
So Trip offered me full time, and I felt that despite we were getting a bit of traction with Tom's Instagram, and we were doing some cool partnerships and things like that, but we decided that it was actually a really good place. Or I decided, rather than I mean, we didn't sit down and kind of hold hands or anything like that. We, uh, we, I decided that I thought it was actually a better move for me to go into an environment that I knew had really good potential. I thought the CBD space was particularly interesting uh, and already had seen a little bit of growth uh, in the market. And so I moved to Trip uh, full time around two years ago. And kind of in the background, Tom and I were doing little projects together and still doing, I mean, still to this day I do is commercial partnerships, which is uh, particularly challenging. Um, but, uh, but yeah, still doing that on the side. And tri Trip was probably, if I, if I take all of the chapters, was, was probably the most impactful for me, from in particular for what I'm doing right now. Because it, it really opened my eyes to the opportunity within retail. Where I'd really, I'd spent so much of my career predominantly online with a little bit of omnichannel, but majority of the business that I'd been with were D to C first, retail second, where Trip was a bit of both, but more retail than, uh, than, than D to C. And so I got to go in there and implement a lot of the, I was the, I was the head of growth at uh, Trip, I got to implement a lot of the learnings that we'd done from Harry's in a way and really trying to focus on profitability from the bottom line and, and, uh, and lots of testing with the website, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the head of growth, by the way, translated more to like, I looked after the marketing budget and e-com, and then we had like a sales team who did the, the kind of selling to the, retail, uh, the retailers, just for context. But I saw the opportunity of how, if you have the right product at the right time, how you can scale retail significantly quicker than you can D2C. And so just, just, just an example, at Trip, we did, when I started, we were in 1,500 stores. And when I left 18 months later, we went to 25,000 stores, which is like an insane rollout. But retailers were are crying out or were crying out within that space of driving incremental young people into, into their store. They're all fighting for those people, and they're the ones that they struggle with the most. And the brand just, just resonated so well from a product on shelf. But also, it does taste really, really good. Not that the CBD does huge amounts. It's very low level. But placebo effect, it does and it does taste great. Um, but it would just really showed for me that if, you get, if, if you've got the right audience, and particularly in that kind of like, I, I describe them rather than, I think a lot of people would say like millennials or Gen Z or whatever it is. But for me, it's like I look at it more as like modern audience. And modern audience is like it doesn't really matter whether you, you have a lot of people who are in the older generations who strive to be buying brands that maybe like if, if for instance, we were um, uh, talking about um, like the Zoe app, for instance, I think that would be a perfect consumer. That is a modern consumer. They go from people who are up to like 25-ish, up to kind of 55, people who are really interested in kind of like being early adopters to new brands. And so that blueprint of, of Trip really got me excited and felt, I really felt the confidence of, of the butter business. And when I was, it was about January time, so I left Trip, I left Trip in August. So in January time, I sat down with Tom, uh, Thomas Straker, and I said, you know what, I'm going to give this a go. I, I know that I've got to do it as a side hustle to start with because we didn't have any money. So I spent about six, seven months with Tom setting up the, the supply chain. And then when it got to that point and I really felt confident in what we've done with Trip, that was the only time where I thought, you know what, this is actually the time to pull the trigger. And before that, if I'm honest, I was, just pe I was absolutely petrified. I was petrified of letting everyone down. I was petrified of letting myself down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so in August time, it was butter business and butter business only. And this is the current latest chapter. And as I said before, like it, without that, that experience for the last 10 or so years, and, and if I look at those four chapters that I had, in particular one to three and most of four, if you told me that I was going to be 34 talking to you guys about the fact that I now have a dairy business, I mean, not a chat, I would have laughed about it. I still actually think it is slightly ridiculous, and particularly when I talk to like, my brothers about it, I'm just like, what the f am I doing? Um, but actually, that, the, the, those last 12 years of making the moves, using a lot of gut, using a lot of initiative, like being a little bit lost, kind of all led to this kind of 
the liquid gold, as I call it, the butter business, which for me is, I find kind of slightly crazy, but also I feel like it's the right thing for me. And I've never, from a career perspective, and as I said at the start, I was very, I felt always in a career itchy feet. I always felt a bit lost, and it's the first time that I've really felt 100% content in what I'm doing. Um, and, we, and we have been fortunate. We've had a really, really strong start. Um, we did, in the first nine weeks, we did about 100,000 blocks of butter. I'm very, I'm very aware, though, that there's lots of stumbling blocks. There's lots of things that, that we need to ensure rate of sales high. We need to ensure that we're being innovative in the, in the, in the, in the category, driving new people. And actually, I've been selling a lot of dreams to supermarkets, as you can probably imagine, about me just basically have this stampede of this audience that they've been after. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I've somehow got to deliver on those promises. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's been a great start. Very, very excited about where it's been so far. And all I ask is, please buy the butter. <laughs> Tell your friends, take some butter from there. And hopefully in 12 months time, I can speak to you all again. And I can tell you about this incredible, successful retail launch we've had. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Any questions, please let me know. Um, just for, for people's context, one thing that um, uh, I'm going to go to you in one second. Tell people who Thomas Straker is, who, do, who yeah. don't know him, because your story didn't go into that, and some people will know, yeah. but he's critical to your success. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, so Thomas Straker is, so I've known him for about 20 years, um, and he, he's a, a kind of a Michelin-trained chef who got out of work at COVID, as I said, and spent a long time working on content to try and basically find an additional income outside of, outside of being a chef. And so from a social media perspective, he was one of the first kind of within, who, who was unknown. Obviously you've got Jamie, Gordon, Nigella, and some of the TV chefs. But he was one of the first who kind of came out of the London restaurant scene and really, and actually was a chef, uh, and really uh, like invested a lot of his time into content. And so. We're now actually between all of his channels is about five million. He's got about five million followers uh, across TikTok, Instagram, and and YouTube. Um, and so we didn't initially look at doing a brand. Like Tom and I have two restaurants in in London, which I do very little for. I basically do the management accounts at the end of the month. Well, go through the management accounts. Definitely don't do them. And that's pretty much it. Uh, we have a little production studio where we create all the content from. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we didn't know about the product, but we, I had this kind of in, inkling that I wanted to do a product. And so we went up and down the supermarket aisles. And we, he's very renowned for butter, so he makes lots of flavored butters. And he has this kind of quenelle at the start that if you on TikTok, you most likely have seen it. Um, so I did, but I didn't want to go into a mindset of the supermarket of thinking, we were going to do butter because he's so renowned for it. But we did like 20 or 30 supermarkets up and down the aisles, up and down the aisles, and just trying to look at categories that we felt fit like the narrative of, like a, uh, of a challenger brand, whether it's like, is it heritage led? Do we think there's volume opportunity? Uh, do we think that the retailers from, from knowing them would be uh, excited about it, et cetera, et cetera? And the stars kind of align the, when we went down the dairy aisle, and not actually just butter, like, if you think about the dairy, like, the cheese, the butter, and the milk aisle has pretty much been the same for 30 years. Like silver, gold, and own label milk. And then the cheese is, is Cathedral City, which is just had a rebrand, but it looks pretty much identical. Um, and so it just, sorry if anyone works for Cathedral City. <laughs> I'm sure it costs a load of money for the rebrand as well. Uh, and so yeah, that was, that was kind of how it, 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 we went into butter. It wasn't just that he did the butters. We did do a bit of research for it before, but yeah, Tom, um, Tom is, def is, is co-founder, and he very much just looks after from a content perspective and, and, and creating the flavors. And for me, he just kind of lets me get on with running the business. OK, another question. Um, head of marketing from Cathedral City. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, from a branding perspective, we're coming from a very different place. And we're really trying to engage with younger audiences. But we know that that's certainly, we think that might initiate first purchase within, within the aisle. However, we also know that like, if the price point's high, then people are probably just going to revert back. And so, well, firstly, we decided to go down the 100% organic route. And so the only other person really in the mass market is uh, Yo Valley uh, versus ourselves in mass. And so that would, I'd say, is our direct competition. 
We also have, um, uh, we, we, we use traditional like butter, uh, butter making, um, traditional butter techniques of how we make it. And so we twice churn it rather than single churn it. So if you, and the, the difference on that from kind of a consumer is that if you actually taste them side by side, it's significantly creamier. Um, and then on top of that, one of, the, one of the things that I picked out from, I mean, whether you love him or hate him, from, what Clarkson's, what, from Jeremy Clarkson with Clarkson's Farm, is that I thought they did an amazing job of, to the mainstream, highlighting the, uh, the issues within the agricultural industry in the UK. And so what we did was, from day one, we did a 1% pledge, so not top line, so top line revenue. We donate 1% of our total revenue to the RABI, which is the Royal Agricultural Benevolent Institute. It's taken me a while to nail that. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and for us, throughout the year, we'll be working on initiatives with farmers in the UK because we're 100% British product. And if you take, for instance, Lurpak, which is the largest branded butter, that's actually using Danish cream. And so for us, we're really kind of putting across the message of eating British. So we feel that if you kind of marry them all together, um, there, there's something, there is a point of differentiation. But one of our biggest challenges, I think, over the next 12 months um, is, is how we talk about that education. Because there's only so much you can do in the packet. Like, we're on our second iteration now of, this is not, this is our first iteration. We've just done a new iteration of the packaging, which will launch in March in line with Sainsbury's, of where we call some more of those key features out rather than, I kind of was having a bit of fun with like the cow's bum on the side and things like that, which looked fun, but I was like, that's actually like core space for us to really be able to resonate uh, and put those messages across. So um, probably, I, I would say it's probably our biggest challenge. Um, uh, and then I suppose the last one from, a, from how we do that, it's how we further our education is that because all of our competitors are so, uh, they, they don't do any social media advertising. They, they're like, we are all, all, already by, a, I think we're double the size of Yo Valley's social media following already. So we're about 70,000 in three months. And so with that, and then Tom's obviously got 4.9 million. We've just brought on a new creator called Ruby Bogle, who you may know, she was on Bake Off. She's an amazing baker and she's got about 700,000 followers. We've just got her on board where she's gonna be championing our, and, and being the face of our sweet butter line. And we think that from a social space where most people here, I would assume that consume a lot of their media through, or their education through social media now, then we can try and utilize that platform to really get that message across as well. But uh, it's a really fair shout and it's a really fair comment. And, and for us, like one of the ones that uh, is certainly gonna be a big challenge over the next, well, I think forever is gonna be a challenge for us to really uh, change that message in particular when these brands have been here for 30 or so years. Yeah, I mean, the supply chain weren't particularly happy about it. Um, <laughs> but we purposely, when we were building the business from the start, I, I had like really, I was incredibly confident about what we could do from a volume perspective. And also, I'd already signed up some pretty, pretty big retail uh, uh, businesses to start. So we had um, Ocado, which we launched with. We launched with Milk and More, which you may not uh, know of, but they're like a giant milk round. Uh, and they have do really, really good volume. We had Modern Milkman. Then we were in all the quick commerce businesses in London, so GoPuff, Get Here. Then we were in Planet Organic, Whole Foods. So we knew that we had like some really big retails aboard. So we kind of prepped the farm up to about 60,000 blocks. We didn't expect to do 100. But from the early stages that we purposely picked the supply chain that we knew that, I, I knew that Sainsbury's were really, really interested uh, from working with them in the past and just kind of like, kind of chatting away with them. So purposely picked the supply chain that we knew that had a premium to it because we knew that it could scale. But we felt that from the start, we built into the business model, in particular when we were talking to early stage investors, that, that we see a, a, a quite a large improvement from our cost of goods from economies of scale. However, we know that right now that our cost of goods is quite high. Uh, and they were, like, they were sold on the fact that we had some of these initial conversations going. So we had a we were fortunate that the supply chain, although did test them a little bit, but they, they basically make all the butter for like Dalesford, they make all the butter for M&S speciality, et cetera, et cetera. So we knew that there was opportunity for us to scale relatively quickly with them. Plus butter is not that hard to make. I mean, <laughs> I definitely. Don't say that. <laughs> And also, and, also, and also, I don't know how to make it. I mean, I can tell you the kind of process, but uh, it's as long as you get a manufacturing plant, it's, uh, it's, it's like 
we can order up to 10 tons of butter within uh, uh, eight days. So it's really quick for us to be able to scale, and particularly if you partner with someone who has the, um, uh, has the scale to be able to do it. I don't know. I think that for me, I, I feel like I've had quite a lot of business ideas over the years, most of them being dreadful. Um, and I've just never quite had, I never felt confident enough in my ability when it came to the work perspective, like knowing that I was going to have to like build a team, I was going to have to raise the money. And I don't know, I just, I, 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 something just clicked within me is that we had an amazing case study that from Trip that I'd been, certainly wasn't 100%, uh, uh, it was, wasn't 100 percent to do with me, but I knew that I was a real key part of it. And I think it just gave me that, that confidence that I needed of where I was like, I think I can do this. Where before, I think I had a, a fantasy in the back of my mind that I could do this, but realistically, if I did this business 12 months ago, for instance, and say we, like Thomas, was at the same size, et cetera, et cetera, there's no way I feel that some of the shit that I've already had to go through from like a fundraising perspective, from like very difficult conversations when it's come to like negotiating a margin with retailers and things like that, I just never feel like I would have been in the place of where I could have really done this justice. And so I think it was just building up the confidence to, to, to be able to, to feel that I could pull the trigger. And I couldn't tell you what, what, it, what it exactly was. It was just something within me that said, do you know what, I feel like I can go for it now. And actually, what is the worst that can happen? Like, I can go back into uh, another job. I could find something eventually. Um, I might have to speak to Max and scrounge a bit of money or something like that, but it's not the, uh, it wasn't really the end of the world. And there's a lot of other shit going on in the, world, <laughs> in the world that I was like, there's worse things that can happen if this doesn't do well. So just, yeah, confidence, I think, what it is, but I couldn't probably pinpoint it. Yeah, I think the, there's a playful side of, of that the start of that, and I, and I think, I, I can't remember what I said in the presentation or I meant to, is that I actually never used to speak about Fresh Fridays in any of my interviews, because I thought it was just kind of like an extension of my university career and I was just partying and having fun. But actually it is, it's so, when I think about creating a brand of all things butter and creating a brand of Fresh Fridays and thinking outside the box of, with, um, with the butter business of like doing kind of fun things within the packaging or some experiential events that we're going to do with butter, like we're going to get a giant cow that just goes down the, the Thames, for instance, which is going to be ridiculous. But those, I think that having that, seeing that the, seeing that back in the day that it is achievable to be able to be playful and have fun and, and do things that are slightly outside the box really still comes into me, when I, into me when, in those meetings of where some people think I'm a bit crazy in some of the, 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 the ideas that I come from, but um, I definitely think that you can do both. I, I, I think that my, my, my career has certainly gone more into the, the, the technical side of things when it comes to data, but uh, I think that if I'd just done that, there is no way that I'd be sat here with all things butter and have kind of dreamt about this kind of slightly bonkers idea that we could, and we could get, sell 100,000 blocks and go into all these retail outlets, unless I'd actually done, seen the slight, what I would, some people would perceive as impossible, happen back when I was kind of 18, 19 years old. Which I think is probably not maybe the best answer to the question, but hopefully kind of half answered it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add one minute. I'm going to add one thing to it because I, I, re, I resonate. That I love the question because I think my head went to bothism, to Nick Aritzen expression. And I, my career has been the opposite in a way. And I learned the grown up stuff first, like studied accountancy, you know, f financial side of marketing, worked at Google. And then I started my own business because you made me. I said it was a terrible idea. But then I started sh shooting from the gut more than the, more than the spreadsheet and the grown up stuff. And like combining those two things is when the magic happened. I actually think the gut is critical for start, for, get, for birthing something, because mm. the spreadsheet will always say no. And actually, an example, one of our big ones was we got our biggest client from that, when you know I sent everyone a plant in the first year, and you said it's an awful idea. Right, I gave you the plants. I got that, I scrounged the plants off you, I sent out 10 plants. And then we had this pitch Sorry, last year, our biggest one ever. And the guy says, it's gone quite well. He says, let me show you this thing. And he pans onto this plant in his office. He said, you sent me that four years ago. And I'm reminded of you every day. 
And I was like, <laughs> I've forgotten we've done it. It's but exactly, well, it was amazing. <laughs> that CAC LTV was mm. off the chart. I, I, can, can I just also just add one last thing as well? Is that I, right at the start as well, knowing that I had this kind of like, I felt this bit of a golden egg with this butter business, whether people think that or not, but for me, felt very passionately about that. But knew immediately that I had a big gap in the business, which was when it came to finance. And so in April, so, it only, so I still was working at Trip and three or four months in, I actually brought a CFO on like, and gave him a big chunk of equity and got him to do a deal and, and got him basically to work for free. So he's a CFO for a big fintech business. He loved the concept of it. And that was, if I, I, again, I would never be where we are right now if it wasn't for him. It was one of the best moves that we made as a, as a team to bring him on board. And, um, and so I think just identifying immediately an area which I knew that I was poor at, particularly knowing I was gonna have to fundraise and obviously have these relationships with supermarkets and Stu, not to bring you into it, but Stu, you know that like, what they're like with, with retailers, like they want you on the money when it comes to like your numbers and everything. And so that was a move that strategically brought in straight away and knowing that there was a gap where I could still have my kind of slightly bonkers brain and let him to really bring me back down and, uh, uh, and come down, so yeah. Right, well, let's give it up. Let's finish there and give it up for Toby. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>